And you know what? Don't do what I do because they have it every time. They have it. It's it's a one-two game. They just do. Don't do it, man. Don't even don't even think about it. He's got it every time. It's just terrible. Just don't do it. Just all right. Let him go. Just let him go. What are you thinking about? Why are you thinking? Think long. Think. Oh, what did you do? You called sixty-five bucks there. Hello everybody, it's Ryan aka Way to Cheese and this is the Taking Vegas vlog number two. Um, weather here in Las Vegas has been absolutely amazing and we don't know how long that's going to last for. So I'm going to grab the dog, run down the street to the Green Valley Ranch District and shoot a quick uh, questions and answer session outside before we get this video kicked off and let's get rolling right now. Alright, we're about to go home and edit a little bit, and then we are going to squeeze into the gym before we get down to the strip. Uh, you know how I am. I don't mess around in the gym. There's no playing. I'm there for gains, and it makes me sick when people sit there on their cell phones, are playing around on the machines, and not taking it seriously. Are you listening? Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. straight onto the grind here. Um, this week we play again at Green Valley Ranch and South Point, but also we go and check out the recently downsized and somewhat controversial Venetian Poker Room, and I show you guys one of my favorite places to eat when I'm grinding there. <laughs> Thank you. 
Alright, I'm going to jump right into some poker hands here. Uh, South Point, Green Valley, and the Venetian. I changed how I did the display and uh, put some graphics in there. It's going to make everything a lot more legible, fun to watch. The catch is it's a lot more work intensive, so I was only able to pick a few hands that I found interesting and uh, break those down for you here. Alright, we're going to jump right in here now. Um, pocket tins on the button at the South Point. Usually pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to open if it gets to us, if it's checked to me. If there's an open, a lot of times I'm going to re-raise on the button here from most players in most positions. This one gets a little complicated, though, because a player we don't really know anything about, he makes it 15 in early position, and there are already three callers before it gets to me. Um, I have some options here. I can raise uh, against someone I know is opening loose from a lot of positions and those flats after it this is actually a great spot for me to make it something like I want to say anywhere from 50 to 75 leaning towards the, the upper of that range the problem is against a random early opener at a 1-2 table and that many callers it's not a good spot for me to uh, play the overplay the tens here or jacks for that matter let's say I make it sixty dollars and it gets back around to the original razor and he flats and all these guys flat tens aren't gonna play great let's say that he raises and everyone folds and it's back to me still not very good situation now let's say that he raises and gets a caller it's still not looking any better for me and worse still let's say he raises and one of these other callers decides to jam any scenario that I raise here and get re-raised and even get called to some extent is not very ideal. So it's a good spot to just play these tens like they're deuces and just go for the implied odds and just flat. That's what we do here and of course we flop a ten and stack two guys. No, that's not what really happened. It actually comes out ace king four with two diamonds which means our hand is pretty much totally over um, especially when the original razor checks the guy to his left makes it like 80 and the guy to his left makes it something like 200 so you know it's easy to say a wasted opportunity tins on the button but any situation where we raise and get action our hands not going to be in great shape unless we know that that first opener is a loose player so just let it go you're at 15 bucks big deal and on to the next one dude why am I taking so long or no I've got a tank I've already folded in my mind there's not even a sick fantasy of a of a shove here and runner runner uh, Broadway and pitch it we're in the big blind we have four eight of clubs alright I like that hand in the big blind I'm calling it's really hard to say it's situational but I'm definitely making some calls here if someone raises one limper under the gun the button makes it six dollars and with a suited triple gapper not even anything to think about it's a easy call under the gun flats as well pretty expected the flop is actually really good for me it's four six seven so I've got a nice uh, gut shot and more importantly my pair of fours rates to be ahead here a lot of the time still no reason to bet I check the under the gun razor checks as does the button 
The turn pairs the six. I check again, and then the gun raiser, uh, then the gun limper bets eight dollars, nine dollars. Button folds. Uh, I call. I still think I'm ahead here, and this is where it gets interesting. The river fills up. Uh, pairs the four too. So now I have the full house, uh, the bottom side of it. There is approximately twenty-eight dollars in the pot. Oh. I'm wrong. Uh, $35 in the pot at this point. And I need to decide if I'm going to bet for value here. Um, I'm going to have the best hand a lot of the times because I think that the under the gun limper, I think he was betting top of his range uh, a hand like eights. More likely, maybe taking a stab at it with two overs, or he picked up a flush draw. And so there's not a whole lot of value in me leading here. Uh, he maybe calls with a hand like 8-8. Eight, eight. I think it's optimistic to say he calls with something like ace high. Uh, this is a 1-2 game. If I lead out here and he significantly raises me, he's going to have weird combinations with six in him. A lot of the time, I'm probably going to be bet folding in that situation. And uh, so I just think there's a much better chance that he's going to stab at it again with a worse hand. And so we check. And unfortunately, he checks behind. And we take it down, of course. Um, I think I made the right choice. I think there was a greater chance of him betting with a worse hand than calling. All right, every once in a while, uh, probably once a month, I'll play a hand that's just completely effed. Uh, and this is that hand, so this is the WTF moment of the hand review. Um, this hand goes bad from the beginning. Uh, let me get it going here. We pick queen 10 off up, and we raise it to five bucks, like, under the gun plus two uh, right away that makes no sense uh, it's not going to accomplish anything that just sets the mood for what ends up being a really strange hand though get called there the button calls us also just flats the blinds flat we got twenty dollars going to the flop in the pot the flop comes queen seven jack with two diamonds uh, we did bet this pre-flop we need to go ahead and lead bet ten dollars we get called on the button just flat again and the blind also calls the turn is a nine we barrel twenty because we did pick up the straight draw and i still have top pair both players call me again the river is the ten which is a lot of times a really good card for me I check here because I've got pretty good showdown value. And now the button. He bets $65 into a $50 pot. And the blind folds and it's to me. Tank time. All right. Like I said, this hand's been a disaster from the beginning. We don't really know where he's at. He shouldn't really have sets here. He shouldn't have a lot of combinations with an 8. Uh, it seems like he could have hands with king in them. Uh, king, queen, king, jack. Uh, I'm a little lost here because he just flat the 5, and then he just flat the 10. And he flat the 20. He just flat every street. Really strange. This is where I get inside my own head and level myself. I'm thinking not a lot of hands get there with an 8 in them. Limited range of hands with a king get there. Uh, the 10 did improve us and that we're beating other two pairs now and we're beating bigger queens. There was two diamonds on the flop and he did just flat so there's flush draws out there. And this is a problem I've had before at the low stakes table where I'll put myself in the other guy's shoes. As played I bet all streets and then I check when the straight card came in on the on the river. So four cards straight on the board. It's such a good spot for him to put out a big bet and pretty much turn my entire range into bluff catching. 
and you're not going to see that all that often at a one two table but I get inside my own head and I'm like that's a great spot for him to do this I would totally do that I've got pretty strong showdown value he's turning a lot of hands into bluffs here and you know what don't do what I do because they have it every time they have it it's, it's a one two game they just do uh, and those few times they don't have it just bite the bullet take those because most of the time they are gonna have it so you know easy fold right don't do it man don't even don't even think about it he's got it every time it's just terrible just don't do it just alright let him go just let him go what are you thinking about why are you thinking think long think oh what did you do you called 65 bucks there He's got something that we had no plan on him having. He's got a pair of queens. He flopped a set and just slow played it the whole way. And uh, really weird for him to play it. He flat five on the button pre-flop and then flat every street. Uh, hey, then he bet when a four card straight came in and he got paid. Uh, good for him. Jeez, that was an ugly hand. All right, let's skip to something that uh, there's no way I can mess up. Straight flush on the flop. Let's see. Six nine suited uh, clubs. We limped here and flop the straight flush. So seven eight ten of clubs on the flop. You're probably thinking, why is this pot so small if you flop a straight flush? And it bears a little explanation here. There was only eight dollars in this flop going to the flop uh, in this pot going to the flop, and they're running a promotion there where high hands can pay anywhere from fifty to several hundred dollars. You do need ten dollars in the pot. So when I flop the straight flush here, the objective is not to build the pot like I normally would it's definitely to find a way to get two dollars more in there and me simply betting two dollars is not necessarily the best way to do that uh, so I checked the flop after this guy over here on the turn he bets 12 uh, which is I'm loving it uh, we're gonna get the bonus here now I'm a little uh, Wonder if I should raise, but you know, three clubs on the board. I feel like he's got a lot of hands that could still improve and then bet again. So I flat behind. The river is the ace. He checks. That's when I bet 35 because some of his combinations have aces. Uh, he does fold and shows the king of clubs. So he was, in fact, going to improve if a club came out, and I'm pretty confident he either would have bet there or uh, check called. And we get a uh, $154 bonus for this hand. So this is just a circumstance where definitely the bonus took precedent over building the pot. What is that? Yeah, $154, uh, nice little bonus. Hard to misplay when you flop a straight flush. It's the last hand we're going to have time to get on here. Uh, it's Venetian time. Already got a nice stack going here. Been grinding a few hours. This guy straddles under the gun. We pick up the camera and look down on the button to Queens. Probably wondering why I just limp it here. And the answer is this under the gun straddler in the last 20 minutes has straddled every button and under the gun every time and he's always popped it to at least 25 unfortunately this is the one time he just checks behind uh... we're kinda hating that when we flop queen six six uh... he checks i check behind because this is just the kind of player who if you feed him rope he's going to bet the hand for you it's just a matter of when on the turn he throws out 25 
and we call him really quickly, trying to show a little false confidence here so he can put us on something like sevens are, you know, a weaker hand that's just getting stubborn. Uh, if he senses any weakness, he's the type that he's going to barrel again. He does. He bets 50 on this five river. And now we have a decision to make. As you can see, we're both pretty deep here. I have almost 500 behind still going in this hand and he does cover so he bets 50 the pot really the pot is um 116 at this point I need to bet a sizing that uh, is going to be appealing for him to try to hero with his value range Hands like ace-10, jack-10, uh, rarely weaker queens. And he's the type that he does get sticky on hands. He's not here to fold. If I size this right, he's going to call with the weaker part of his range. But I also need to size it small enough, considering that we're playing uh, deep here, that he does think that it's a possibility that he can jam over. It's definitely not out of the realm of possibility. He's been playing really aggressively at this table, and he's done things like that. So I decide to make it 125. And I know pretty immediately that the sizing was just right because he tanks, and he tanks, and he asks the dealer how much it is. He clearly doesn't want to call. But when the dealer counts it down here, and it's only 75 more to him, he does make the crying call. Uh, we don't see his hand here. I'm actually pretty confident it was uh, 10. 10 X, you know, his range is anywhere here. But definitely something with minor value and he just can't fold. That's gonna wrap it up for the hands this session. Uh, like I said, this process takes a lot longer. It's a lot more intensive. Uh, I can't do as many hands. These were what I thought was pretty interesting. I bet you all want to know how I did. This week we played 27 and a half hours of live poker and we were profitable to the tune of $864. Uh, still a little low side on the volume, but I did put in about 14 hours online. Um, so it's not that terrible. Um, quick voiceover, uh, I'm about to take you guys to check out this place, Lobster Me. It's upstairs at the Venetian. Um, great place to grab something kind of on the heavy side. And I'm absolutely starving at this point. Um, you can see I'm walking here. Uh, I did do a little uh, walking dialogue with the camera. But I think I need to get an external mic on one of my other cameras because the ambient noise in the casino like this. It's just like absolutely inaudible. So this place, Lobster Me, amazing lobster rolls if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, several to choose from. They range from I think 15 to 20 dollars, and there is a locals discount. Um, they load these things down. You're like, I know what you're thinking, lobster rolls in Vegas, but these things are amazing. I've been to Maryland. I've been to Maine. I've personally braved the frigid waters of the Atlantic to pull up the freshest lobsters with my bare hands and cooked them into my own delicious lobster rolls. One of those three things is a lie. But having said that, these things compete with the whole field in the lobster roll department. Oh, I've also had those like overhyped food truck ones. And while they're not bad, this place is the best. Check it out. Just go eat there. Tell me how amazing lobster rolls are. You'll thank me. All right, I went with the Connecticut and it looks really awesome tonight. I am so hungry. Oh, yes. That is so good. <laughs> That's going to wrap it up for this video. Um, episode's done. Please like the video, share it with your friends, um, subscribe to the channel, 
check the link out for the questions and answers video that we had to pull from this main one and it will be on the channel and I'm probably gonna make a extra supplemental video for more hands because I just wasn't happy with the amount I was able to fit in in here so uh, poker content junkies check that out got a lot of cool stuff coming out so many good ideas just gotta get better at this camera and editing stuff and uh, we'll see you soon for some cool stuff